real sorcerer. But I'll gladly test your steel, old friend. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Rest of Your Orbis channel live stream for the bizarre U.S. Civil War. Let's we'll give a hello to everyone who's out there. Hello, Chassis. Hello, Quantum Paradox. Hey, Guyana Spice. Hey, Jamie. Good to see you. Who else have we got? Frank Jones. Welcome. DM. Welcome. Sky Sage. Good to see you. DZ Enyo. Good to see you. Zuke. Welcome. Hello, Christina. Hello, Candidates. Good to see you. And just give everybody a little bit of a chance to log on there. It's good to see you, Jamie. I hope everybody's doing well. Hey, Bluegrass. Welcome. Hey, Robert. Good to see you. Hello, Peter. Hey, Kathy. Good to see you. Hey, Tara. Peter Strada, good to see ya. Ania, good to see ya. Crayfish Tribe, welcome. Hey, Dave, good to see ya. Welcome. Runaway Sailing. Hey, Cat, good to see ya. Rebecca, good to see ya. Welcome. My Bailiwick Zone, good to see ya. Hey, Charlie. CJ Trickstar, good to see ya. All rest on ashes. Welcome. You know, the other nice thing about doing the greeting is it gives everybody a chance to log in and get on the live stream. And I always appreciate that. Hey, Josh. Yeah, Micah. Welcome. PJCC West. Good to see you. Jake Roberts. Not Jake the Snake, right? <laughs> All right. M. Rose. Nice to see you. Neighbor Bear. Joseph Lemieux. Hopefully I got that right. Cruising Gal. Good to see you. Oh, yeah, we got some dodgy war tales coming right up. Hey, Captain Flatastic, good to see you. All right, well, I'll keep saying hi to everybody as I see them. So this particular exploration, this live stream on the bizarre U.S. Civil War is based on several requests. So we did a little bit of a survey or vote probably about three, four weeks ago. And we looked to see what you'd like to do for a live stream. And, of course, the Civil War came up. And we're going to do this one a little bit different. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and just do a little bit of a review, a presentation, if you will, on each different segment on several different aspects of the Civil War. And then we're going to look at it and then talk about it. So I don't want to make this like an academic session, but it's a little bit different than uh, what we've done. Thanks, Crypto. I appreciate that. Go ahead and hit that like button as you're logging in. Much obliged. Much obliged. So the first thing I want you to take into heart, and does everybody see my screen okay? Can you see why it's important to ask questions? And someone just give me a heads up that you can see the screen okay, because the saying here is actually something that I had for my students back in the day. First knowledge becomes a process of conforming. All right, perfect. Thank you. So this was from one of the very early explorations I did, why it's important to ask questions. But believe it or not, this was something that I had from my teaching days, and I would show my students to start our entire history lesson. And yes, in the interest of full disclosure, I did actually used to teach a Civil War lesson. But it's important to ask questions because what you see here is the actual presentation of how perceptions can be shaped with a picture. So you have the same picture but you have three different historical accounts with each picture. Historical account one, it's a dedication ceremony. It's an amazing building that took years to complete. Caption two, this is the dedication of a major monument across the road from this building. So there's a monument that you can't see that this picture is being taken from. And then account three, it's a large group of refugees from a war-torn land celebrating their arrival. Now, we know which one of these is correct according to the history, but the reason I show this is this just goes to show how a picture alone, even if it's real and authentic, you can have your perceptions changed on it. And suddenly first knowledge becomes a process of conforming. So in other words, once someone informs you of something and it's the first time you learn it, it becomes very difficult to unlearn something. Hey, Sooner West, good to see you. And so the whole point of learning and unlearning is that becomes our perception and that becomes our reality. And what I want you to do as we go through this on the Civil War is drop what you think you know, drop all the theories that I've shared so far, because we're really going to look at it in detail. Sky Sage, good to see you. I see you. Oh, yeah. And for those of you who aren't from the United States, we'll just go ahead and dive into this now. Where does the Civil War really come from? A lot of our perceptions are currently shaped by the film The Civil War by Ken Burns. Now. Prior to this, it was very difficult to find photographs of the Civil War. They were not readily available. You only found them in certain books. 
And it really wasn't easy to ascertain exactly what was going on. And we'll get to all the different aspects of the Civil War. But the reason I start with the whole Ken Burns film is this is how a lot of people believe that the Civil War went down. It's the way Ken Burns told the story. Now, Ken Burns is a documentary filmmaker. Oh, yeah. And prior to this, perceptions of the Civil War changed quite a bit. So if you go back to Gone with the Wind, a film that came out in the late 1930s, that shaped American perceptions of the Civil War. Then in the 1970s, things seemed to change again. And if you watch old episodes of Little House in the Prairie, if you look at the outlaw Josie Wales, you'll see that there seemed to be a little bit more of a sympathetic tone to the Confederacy. But, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was a long time ago that I did those Civil War videos. You're right. So, <laughs> in any event, the film, the documentary film by Ken Burns, The Civil War, is a PBS film. And after that, suddenly you saw all of these different photos from the Civil War. And Ken Burns is a very good documentary filmmaker. I mean, just got to have to call it like I see it. And here's what Ken Burns looks like, for those of you who don't know. And he's pictured here with Shelby Foote who's a Southern author from Mississippi, no less. And if you haven't seen the documentary, The Civil War, Ken Burns does it with a bunch of different images that he found and does slow camera reveal with a soundtrack, a Hollywood cast to do voiceovers for all the famous figures from the Civil War. And then he consults various historians, such as Shelby Foote here. Now, the interesting thing about Shelby Foote, though, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of people who say that and a lot of people who believe that. And like I said, much like in the way that Carl Sagan speaks, you know, Carl Sagan speaks very clearly and articulately. Ken Burns presents a documentary film very effectively. I mean, he knows exactly how to convey it. And he's very good at it. And so that's really where this comes from. A lot of people, their first knowledge of the Civil War was from watching this film and what Ken Burns and Shelby Foote told them. And so that's where it all started. Now, where things start to get a little bit more dicey. When you look into the history of Shelby Foote, so this is Shelby Foote down here, after he passed away a couple years ago, more details on his personal history became available, which I always found interesting because let's just say that uh, Shelby Foote had some perceptions that weren't exactly very popular. He was, well, nowadays they'd call him a Southern sympathizer and he believed in the Confederate flag and what it stood for. And you know, that's just, you know, something you can't say now. But all beside that, going past Shelby Foote and Ken Burns, they shaped the perceptions of the Civil War. Now, I saw some of you already talking about the problematic images of the Civil War. And so we'll go down to our first uh, banner here. Here's my baseline assumptions of the Civil War. Assumptions. The conflict did occur. A conflict occurred that had loss of life and material destruction. Now, oh yeah, Absolutely, Jamie. All very informative and convincing for people who don't care to think. And it's presented very well. And I always find it funny that the opening theme tune for Ken Burns' The Civil War is a show can farewell, a song that was composed in the early 1980s. You know, I mean, just imagine if we would have picked some other song for it. <laughs> but you were all talking about how a lot of the images are problematic. And that's something I've covered in the other Civil War videos. And we'll just look at a couple of them. So here are some of those problematic images. And these are supposedly... This is a Confederate defensive position in South Carolina. Very well-constructed building here that certainly matches what we'd later affiliate with Beau Arts, although Beau Arts goes from 1800 to 1900, so hard to say anything here. And then this nice tower in the background. And we'll look at a couple more. This is what we have for our Civil War battle photography. It's a painting. There is no photography of actual battles from the Civil War. Yeah, exactly. And you are all correct with all those comments. So, well, thanks for joining us, Daniel. Oh, yeah. And these paintings are actually what you have the nearest thing to battle for or battle photography. So, anyway, so back to assumptions conflict did occur, but this is what we're going off of. Now, we have all kinds of strange images with a lot of posing from the war, where you'll see soldiers in different states of dress. Ugh, isn't this grotesque? But what you notice is they seem to be well-equipped. They're wearing consistent uniforms, although you do get a little bit of a conflict on the blue and the gray. So the North, the Union wore blue, supposedly. The South, the Confederacy wore gray, or so we're told. But then you have other images like this. And one of the shaping aspects of the United States Civil War was the Mexican War, where the United States managed to invade Mexico in the 1840s and sustain long lines of logistics and communications and capture Mexico City and won the war. That's where a lot of the Civil War veterans supposedly got their experience from. 
Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and uh, when we see some other images, you'll see what the problems are with that. So, yeah, so we're told, Christina, so we're told. But moving on at the presentations of images, you also have a lot of bizarre images such as this, where it looks like everybody's just out camping, having a good time. You know, you have some of the limitations in photography seen back here. Basically, there's no such thing as an uninteresting Civil War photo. If you look at it closely enough, you can, you can find all kinds of interesting aspects to it. Everybody always seems to be posing. Everyone's very relaxed. Now, it is true that soldiers can be very relaxed, but we always see odd things with different individuals, different ranks, different uniforms, the blue and the gray. This is an interesting one, though, that I like to show because what this shows you is an entire formation. In other words, a unit of soldiers. And supposedly they're marching. But yet we don't seem to have any issue with any of the blurring, although we do with the horses. So it's hard to tell what's going on now. I mean, they could just be there stationary in a formation and that's when they caught the picture. But it's odd when you try to consider the technical accuracy. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Kathy. And that's what they that's what they'd be told, too, especially by a non-commissioned officer these days. Yeah, a bunch of slackers. You're absolutely right. But that's what we tend to see. And yet we're supposed to take all this at face value. So it's rather strange. So right off the bat, the images that, by the way, we didn't have access to, a lot of them prior to the Civil War by Ken Burns, which was released in 1990, they changed. You also have a lot of soldiers posing with their significant others. Now, there's nothing too out of the ordinary about that, but yet when we consider how many of these images that we have, I mean, there are hundreds, if not thousands of these images, soldiers on both sides who had access to photography, even though we're told it was limited, and they posed with their significant other. We also have this strange view of the landscape. Many locations in the South were told that the battles occurred. And if you've been around Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Florida, anywhere around that area, this isn't exactly the kind of terrain you expect to see. It's really weird. It almost looks like the, the Dust Bowl, as though the terrain's desiccated. Now, could the pictures have been taken somewhere in the North during the winter? Sure. But if you look closely enough, you get that running theme with it. Oh, yeah. And you're right with those uh, comments and observations. Oftentimes there is no background with a lot of them. And so it becomes very problematic to assess what's going on and when it is. Now, I include this little image for you because this shows you how photos can be manipulated. Now, there are a lot of questionable photos from the Civil War to include all kinds of strange and bizarre occurrences. But can we rely on them? Well, did Tickle Me Elmo fight in the Civil War? I don't know. But I'm showing you this because don't forget that we do have to contend with photo manipulation. Yeah, exactly. But I I'm just showing this to you to show you what can be done with photographs. And it doesn't look all that bizarre in some ways. I mean, we can tear this photograph apart. And yet this photograph would stand up to scrutiny more than some of the other ones that we've seen. Now, wouldn't it? Because you do have some very well-detailed individuals, and you have a very well-detailed Tickle Me Elmo or Oscar the Grouch or whoever you want there. So, <laughs> yep, and that's what it really boils down to. A lot of photos of people standing around, and, you know, I'm just showing this to you to give you an example of how photos can be changed. And we all know this, but we have to be reminded of it, because oftentimes when we look at photos, we see what we want to see. Oh, uh, yeah, and you're actually seeing one of the inconsistencies with it there, Senior West. You're absolutely right. A lot of inconsistencies. So again, process of conforming. Now we talked about the United States' ability to invade Mexico, and oddly enough, uh, that was carried out by Winfield Scott. We'll talk about him later, but we're told that the United States won that war by launching a seaborne invasion, landing in Veracruz, and then marching across the land and capturing Mexico City. And oddly enough, they managed to sustain this difficult logistical challenge at a time when it seemed impossible. So again, many of the U.S. Army officers on both sides of the war in the Civil War or the Confederate States officers served in this conflict. So it's something to be aware of. Now, we do have many books about the Civil War, and I did review this one, and I always found this very interesting in terms of how well developed this infrastructure is in Washington. I mean, look how well built this bridge is, some of these foundation blocks, and then what appears to be a train depot. Look at some of the construction on this. Very, very strange and very odd. And again, it just brings up more questions from the Civil War. You know, what was actually the capability at the time? What was really going on? Yeah, was it a war? Was it uh, something else? You know, that's always the question that we have about it. But you look at any sort of photo, you look at any sort of book, and you just end up with more questions than answers. And it's very difficult to quote unquote document. So it's just something to remember. It is the mother 
or the father of all conflicting accounts. Yeah, that's probably a good way to summarize it there, Robert. <laughs> yeah, and there's definitely something to that. There was a lot of systematic destruction, but let's get into it a little bit more. So here we have good old Elijah Hunt Rhodes. He was one of the main characters of Ken Burns' Civil War. I don't remember who voiced him, but he gives a lot of the narration. You also have many photos of Confederate soldiers who look like they're just having a grand old time. Now, here's a question for y'all. Who wore the blue and the gray? Now, we told you that it was the Union and the South, the Confederacy. But did the United States Army have a time frame where it wore both blue and gray? Well, what do you think? Would you be surprised to know that prior to the United States Civil War, the United States Army did wear gray, and it did wear gray as part of the gray line in West Point. So it's interesting for me to note that both armies wore blue and gray. And yes, you have many photos like this of destruction, although oddly enough, these destruction photos are not just set in the South. We do have a destruction photo of one in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, which was supposedly done by a raid. Now, this is a Confederate unit. And look how well equipped they are. Now, one of the constant themes we had from the United States Civil War was how poorly equipped the Confederate Army was. They oftentimes didn't have shoes. But this picture paints a very different picture. Now, does that mean it could have been different? Nice flag there, huh? Maybe. It's just, again, another conflicting account. And like I said, you can look at pictures all day under the sun from the Civil War and have more issues than you ever know what to do with. <laughs> yeah, they sure did. And that, that's something that we see in a lot of the photos, and it quote-unquote is very well documented. So, yeah, they're all very well equipped. And also keep in mind that according to the official history, that the United States Army and the Confederate States Army had never done mass mobilization. They never suited up armies of hundreds of thousands. They only fought small battles, and the Mexican War only involved a couple thousand soldiers in the regular United States Army. But suddenly they managed to pull all this off, all the logistical challenges. And here's another one of these questionable photos where you see this is clearly a column that's moving, and yet we can very well see it. Now, why is it we don't have any battle photographs? And we'll have all sorts of reasons. Well, because even though they were fighting Napoleonic tactics where they marched in slow formations, nobody wanted to really see it or take the risk of getting a picture, and so therein lies the problem. And so that's why you see a lot of images like this where you see formations marching, but you don't see any battlefield photographs, which is really strange. So. Yep, exactly, Robert, exactly. And that's something that we noticed. Well, thanks, Rory. I really appreciate that. I'm glad you're enjoying it so far. So we're just getting started. We're just looking at the initial photographs that we have. So anyway, back on to where we were. So remember this, first knowledge becomes a process of conforming. You have the knowledge, you're going to conform to it. Now, this is from the Mexican War, oddly enough. Nice architecture here. And this just showed us how un, or how ineffective fixed fortifications were. Chapultepec Castle, all the other star forts that we talked about. All right, now we're transitioning here. The Know Nothing Party. Now, who here has heard about the Know Nothing Party? And what is significant about the Know Nothing Party? Yeah, exactly. So we've looked at all these photos, but we have uh, nothing to really back it up. But back to the Know Nothing Party. So the significance of the Know Nothing Party was this is supposedly a nativist political party. It was also a populist political party. And they did not like the Irish, supposedly. They did not like the Catholic Church. And supposedly this political party was so powerful that they conducted attacks in the streets against Irish people who were Catholics, immigrants. And of course, now the Smithsonian tries to tie this into modern populist American politics, even though it has nothing to do with it. What's interesting about the Know Nothing Party, though, was that it was very active in the 1850s, and then right before the United States Civil War, it just seemed to disappear. And it's funny looking at the articles on how they try to do cheetah flips with this, intellectual cheetah flips, on why the Know Nothing Party suddenly just went away. And they try to say it's because, well, they weren't relevant anymore, because suddenly slavery became the issue. Even though slavery had nothing to do with the Know Nothing Party, according to the official history. And here's another strange thing. The Know Nothing Party is not really touched in Ken Burns' little civil war. So it's really, really bizarre. And you really didn't see the Know Nothing Party talked about in detail and in historical circles until after 2000. I'm not kidding. 
Now, there are some books that documented them, but it's always odd how they change the emphasis on certain aspects of history and who does what and who knows what. But what's odd about the Know Nothing Party is if they did exist, it's proof that political parties are not established by grassroots Americans. They're established by a higher power. And there's no conspiracy about that. That's just the way it is. Because if they were truly a grassroots populist political party, they wouldn't just go away in the snap of a finger. So let's consider the causes of the Civil War. Now, remember, this is what we're told. So here you have good old General Winfield Scott. Ah, yes, this is the commander in chief of the United States Army at the start of the U.S. Civil War in 1861. And you can see he's in great shape there. And he could easily pass the modern U.S. Army physical fitness test. Actually, they say he couldn't even mount a horse at that time. But he's quite an interesting character. And the causes all came down to what we're told and what's been reinforced ever since Ken Burns' the Civil War and long before that. The war was about slavery. Here you have John Brown. He was a radical abolitionist. And in fact, he believed that violence was the only way to end slavery. And oddly enough, the fact that John Brown was so active at the time and believe it or not, he started off as a preacher. What's really strange, though, is that John Brown didn't become famous until the 1850s. And yet we have no shortage of photos and documentation on John Brown. It's really bizarre. It's as though this guy was suddenly made famous after the fact. And you have many, many different pictures of him without the beard, with the beard. And he launched a very famous raid. Oh, here's a little structure that he supposedly met in in Iowa. Yeah, here we go. Factoring into Iowa again, but nice little structure there. I find it's interesting. It's documented. He launched a little raid on Harper's Ferry, which is a federal arsenal. And supposedly that's where they were storing weapons. And he was trying to incite a slave revolt. And this guy by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee stopped him. There were, yeah, exactly. And that great, great point there. That, that same look that you see with them as well. But we have different statements that say that the causes were down to slavery, the causes were down to states' rights, the causes were this and that. The whole reason we started with the Know Nothing Party, though, is we seem to be shifting directions. So it's a nativist party, and now slavery is evil. People are willing to fight a war over slavery. Yeah, and you know what, Sky Sage, Harper Ferry, Harper's Ferry is an old world treasure trove. I need to do an on-site exploration of that. But, but anyway, that's what we're told the causes were. And you can actually go back and look at interviews with Shelby Foote, and even he talks about how they're kind of changing the perception of the Civil War. Now, who knows exactly what happened? But one of his complaints, and this is Shelby Foote's words, is that Ken Burns was making the Civil War a little too much about slavery and not enough about what the original causes actually were. But it's quite intriguing how it goes back and forth. Now, this is what Shelby Foote said. I'm quoting him, and he's been passed away. And if you look at Shelby Foote's biography, it's quite interesting as well. The author who kind of disagreed with Ken Burns, but like Ken Burns because Ken Burns made him famous being on the Civil War. And they have this nice little statue erected to the memory of John Brown in Kansas. And so, very interesting. And, of course, we have a plaque, so we know not to question it, right? <laughs> Now, technology of the Civil War. This is where things get really interesting because we're told that the technology of the Civil War was a leap ahead. We had the Industrial Revolution going on at that time. We know that the North had a submarine, the USS Alligator. I did not know that the North had a submarine. I was aware that they tried to turtle during the U.S. Revolutionary War. It didn't work so well. And I was aware that the Confederates had the Hunley and did one attack with it. But apparently the North had the USS Alligator, a full-up submarine. So I don't know if you're aware of that. I've covered that in the technology video. They also innovated the Gatling gun, the predecessor to the machine gun, and it was used quite effectively. So this shows the sudden technological advances in the United States Civil War. Then you also have this hydrogen pump that was used to inflate the balloon, the Intrepid, the Union Aerial Balloon Corps. So they had balloons. Isn't this a great picture? What do you all think of this picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't argue with you on that one, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, and, and that's proof of that as well. So just a sudden technological leap that's very, very unbelievable, and yet at the same time, we're told that they had this capability the entire time. Here you got Taddeus Lowe, supposedly the civilian who ran the Union Balloon Corps. You think it'd give him a huge advantage, but uh, old General McClellan didn't want to go with it. So let's go on to the tactics of the Civil War. So we talked about the technology. 
One of the things they try to tell us is that the tactics in the Civil War were very antiquated. Now, this is the Battle of Fredericksburg, where the Union attempted to launch a frontal assault against walled Confederate positions. And for whatever reason, it didn't work. And what Shelby Foote will tell you is that the reason the Civil War was so bloody, don't talk about diseases or anything like that, is their tactics were out of date. And they were massing men and marching up in straight lines and then just getting slaughtered. Well, I'm glad you caught me. And so what we have is this, we have these obsolete tactics and these obsolete medical practices. And this is how we explain these huge casualties. Now, casualty figures, if you haven't noticed, like population figures, they're very fluid. They seem to change quite frequently. And so, yeah, exactly. When you look at a lot of these battles, you just see that they're fighting shoulder to shoulder. So again, if somebody was doing a picnic and watching a battle, why couldn't they have set up old Matthew Brady and his photo or photography team and get some pictures of them lining up? It would take forever to line up these formations. And in the Battle of Fredericksburg, we're told that there were how many different charges by the Union? And of course, they failed and they were slaughtered on the field, although who knows what the ground truth reality is. And so this is what you see with a lot of the different battles. Now, oddly enough, in Vicksburg, you see Ulysses S. Grant, of all people, who was notorious for frontal assaults, actually using some maneuver here and going around Vicksburg. So it's really strange. It's a conflicting account. Yeah, tactics should be based on weapons technology, but the excuse we're given for the large casualty figures is they didn't adapt very well. But again, there's a conflicting account with that as well, which is very intriguing. So going back to the different battles, what's odd, though, is then the Confederates decided to try a frontal assault in the famous Pickett's Charge, and they were slaughtered on day three in the major battle of Gettysburg, even though the Confederates had actually been fighting on the defensive most of the time. And you would think they would have seen how ineffective these horrifying frontal assaults were, and yet they still did them regardless. So it's really, really strange and bizarre. And this is supposedly a photograph of one of the cannon crews from the Union in the Battle of Gettysburg. Isn't this an interesting photo? So I'll be sure to post this on Reddit so you can analyze these on your own. Because like I said, there's never a photo that doesn't bring up a lot of different questions. All right, so let's go on to the next portion here. And that's going to be massive leadership incompetence. And that's actually on both sides of the Civil War. So again, you've got more questionable aspects. You have commanders such as Ambrose Burnside here who failed in the Battle of Fredericksburg, sent thousands of Union soldiers in futile frontal assaults to be killed, and, you know, they even call it simply murder. It was murder. He offered his resignation after these attacks failed, but they wouldn't accept his resignation. They kept him in command, and he kept failing. And that's something you see on both sides. And it wasn't until the Battle of the Crater, when, according to the official account, they had a U.S., they called them colored troops, African-American soldier formations that were trained to assault after they detonated this bomb to create a crater, and then they changed out the formation that was going to do it, and it failed miserably. Finally, they relieved this guy. But it's really weird. If you look into his history, they never wanted to relieve him. Braxton Bragg, same thing with the Confederates. He was basically the most incompetent Confederate commander, even though the guy was an experienced U.S. Army officer, and he served with the distinction during the Mexican War. He even saved the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, in the Battle of Buena Vista by using cannons effectively. We're told he was an artillery officer. But then, oddly enough, in this battle, Battle of Missionary Ridge in Chattanooga, and this is when Bragg was in command, we actually see the Union doing a frontal charge that actually works, or as David McCullough would say in the Civil War, it worked. But the explanation they give for this frontal assault working is that it was uncoordinated and the soldiers took the initiative themselves. And oddly enough, old Braxton Bragg, despite being an artillery officer, he supposedly placed his cannon here up on the crest, the topographical crest of a hill, not on the military crest. And so what that means is that his cannons couldn't fire down on the assaulting Union soldiers. They were in the dead space right here where the cannons couldn't engage them. So a guy who knew how to properly place his cannons in the Mexican War suddenly forgot how to do it during the United States Civil War and made a huge mistake that cost him the battle. And suddenly a frontal assault actually worked. And so, again, it shows this incompetence. And for whatever reason, we're told that Jefferson Davis respected this guy. He didn't relieve him. So it's really, really strange. Another account of total incompetence, things not working. 
Now, oddly enough, this gentleman, Arthur MacArthur, who was with the Wisconsin Regiment, earned himself the Medal of Honor, highest U.S. military award, because during the assault on Missionary Ridge, he got up and held a flag and waved it around and said, Onward, Wisconsin! They gave him the Medal of Honor for that. Well, at least they gave him the Medal of Honor for doing something successful. It did, in fact, happen. You might know his son a little bit better, Douglas MacArthur. His son was awarded the Medal of Honor for um, preparing the defense of the Philippines. And here you can read the citation of it. Although uh, it was not a successful defense of the Philippines, but that was not on him because if there's one thing to know about Douglas MacArthur, he did not make mistakes. It was all in his subordinates. It was subordinates of fault, fault they were not prepared to repel the Japanese surprise attack. And it was subordinates of fault that he did not, he was not able to defend the Bataan Peninsula, but they still gave him the Medal of Honor for it. Oh, by the way, did you know that he also tried to keep his subordinate, General Wainwright, from winning the Medal of Honor, who actually went with his soldiers and surrendered with him? And underwent this unfortunate experience called the Death March of Bataan, where U.S. soldiers and Philippine soldiers were taken and killed by the Japanese because the defense was ineffective. So I just highlight that because it shows how politics work in the United States military, and it's pretty much been the same for a long time. And I know it is very controversial to say bad things about General Douglas MacArthur, and I'm not. I'm simply upholding the fact that he doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> so, but it, going back to the Civil War, we have other leaders who had all sorts of issues who were never relieved. Robert E. Lee was considered the best tactician of the Civil War. And yet we talked about earlier how he made the decision to do a fatal frontal battle of Gettysburg, even though he saw in the Battle of Fredericksburg that these tactics didn't work. So what, he just suddenly forgot it? And it's very interesting seeing the historians try to justify this. Well, R Lee was an aggressive commander. He was all about doing aggressive things to achieve rapid results. Just, it resulted in occasional disaster. You also have this guy, George B. McClellan, who is Ken Burns' big hero. We brought him up many times. Supposedly, he was little Napoleon, and he was very good at training the army, but he never really won a single battle aside from defeating Robert E. Lee at the start of the war. He ran against uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1864 and lost in the presidential election. And now we have this individual. And of course, I'm going to bring up somebody from Iowa. <laughs> Absolutely right. This is Francis Marion Drake, and this is his real name. And I just, I highlight an example because Iowa was the northern state that provided the highest percentage of soldiers. Now, not the most soldiers, obviously, that was New York, but most of uh, the mo the highest percentage of population came from Iowa. Francis Marion Drake here, though, got his uh, unit while conducting a reconnaissance ambushed. Somehow they were ambushed by 7,000 dismounted Confederate cavalrymen. And most of his soldiers were taken prisoner and died in a prison camp in Camp Tyler in Texas. A lot of Iowans. But that didn't stop him from rising in the ranks. Uh, he became very popular because suddenly he was appointed to a court martial commission and court martialed his own commanding officer. How the heck that happens, I don't know. Supposedly for being drunk on duty. Probably because his commanding officer had dirt on him and was going to report him or if any of this even happened. You know, It's just funny when you have all these stories. He would subsequently become governor of Iowa, believe it or not, for being very militarily incompetent. Nice boots too. Check these boots out. <laughs> now we go on to the next aspect of it. And we're going to transition because we've gone through what we're officially told about the war. Now we have some theories. <laughs> yeah, might have been. Might have been. That's for sure. So, first theory. Prisoner of war camps and soldier homes. One of the major stories from the United States Civil War was the prisoner war camps. Both sides had extensive civil or had extensive civil war uh, prisoner of war camps. And here you can see them. And supposedly these were horrible places. This is allegedly Andersonville in Georgia where Union prisoners were kept. Many died in very squalid conditions. Here's another prisoner war camp, supposedly up north, although it's really hard to tell. Now here's where things get interesting. This is Fort Warren in Boston Harbor, a prisoner war camp for Confederate soldiers. Very well constructed, isn't it? I think you know where this is going. Here's what it looks like today, and I like how they have the 1850 on it. And then you see some of the other well-constructed aspects of it. Oh, look at those blocks there. Kind of reminds me of the foundation blocks of the Iowa State Capitol. I know I can't help but bring it up. And then you see what Fort Warren really looks like. What do you think? <laughs> oh, yeah, she's a beauty. Now, do I think that these prisoner of war camps really existed? Yes. And do I think they were used as we were told that they were? Yes. And why is that? 
because there are lots of accounts of many soldiers and other individuals going to these places and they died in large numbers. And so suddenly you get the idea that what was really what was really going on with the Civil War was that it was the chance to get rid of a lot of people. It was a different kind of conflict. And think of these as detention camps, concentration camps, relocation camps. People were held here and they were killed, unfortunately. And we do have accounts of many Union soldiers dying in Andersonville and then many Confederate soldiers dying in the Union prisoner war camps because of poor conditions. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why it's one of the critical theories. Here's where it starts to get really interesting, though. Yeah, I know. That's usually my statement. This is what's called a soldier's home, and I explored this in an early exploration on the channel. This is the one in Milwaukee. So after the Civil War, they had all these soldier's homes that were built in both the North and the South, and they had, one, this elaborate architecture, but two, these weren't single buildings. These were entire compounds. Here's one in Dayton, Ohio, and you can see some very well-constructed buildings. I don't know what the heck this is. I'm sure we'll be told it's a flagpole. Very intriguing. And then you see some other advanced architecture. But at the end of the day, they sent soldiers to these places after the Civil War to live out their lives. Exactly, Sky Sage. And that's really where the asylum campaign started. And that's where it really gets interesting. Because if you think these are old world constructions that were repurposed, this is where they sent all these soldiers to live out their time and not talk about exactly what happened. Yeah, exactly, Chassis. <laughs> Cell tower, you got it. And I know I'm covering a lot here pretty quick, but this is one of the first big theories here. So it wasn't just prisoner of war camps that ended with the Civil War. These soldier homes continued well into the 1900s, if not beyond. And so here you have uh, this entire map, and you see this is a huge compound, the National Military Home in Dayton, Ohio. Large old main buildings. It can sustain itself. And yet we've seen this layout before. It's just like an asylum. And that's what they call them, soldiers' asylums. So make of that what you will. Mm -hmm. Exactly, Rebecca. Evil does know no bounds. And it's a great example right here. And so that's why you see one of the first big theories here, though, is with the prisoner of war camps. Oh, and here's another one. Isn't this an interesting building here? What was this building called? Oh, this is the quartermaster and commissary building. For those of you who don't know, the commissary is kind of like your grocery store on a military post. Well, manicured lawns and very nice domes and nice building here. What do you think of this one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right, Heidi. And they had lots of rocking chairs there too, didn't they? Yeah, doesn't it? Well, this was really in Dayton, Ohio, or so we're told. Not exactly what you'd expect to see in Dayton, Ohio. Well, gee, Maxwell, you might have to uh, look into that for us if you're on the ground there. See what you can find out about that old soldier's home and if there's anything left from it. I have not had the pleasure of being to Dayton, Ohio. Uh, strong feelings about it. Not surprised. Not surprised. So, all right, let's go on to uh, theory two. And theory two is the Anaconda Plan. The Anaconda Plan was the brainchild of Winfield Scott. And Winfield Scott is interesting because we're told he made general in the War of 1812. And then he was serving as the commanding general of the United States Army in 1861. But as we said, his health was failing. He had gout. And you can see he doesn't appear to be the most healthy individual. But he came up with this interesting plan, the Anaconda Plan. Now, what's really strange about the Anaconda Plan is, again, this is a military and a nation that's suddenly fighting away it never did. We see how the United States military won the Mexican War. They landed and they seized the capital of Mexico. That's how you won wars. But the Anaconda Plan is a concept of total war. And so what you're seeing is with the Anaconda Plan, it's a plan to blockade the South, destroy the cities, and control the key terrain and then wear down the nation. And yet what wasn't part of the Anaconda Plan was all these campaigns. Now, would you be surprised to know that there were land campaigns that went all over the South? So we know about Sherman's march to Atlanta, down to Savannah. We know about coming up into South Carolina, North Carolina. We know about the Army of the Potomac invading Virginia. We know about the Western forces getting down into Arkansas and Mississippi. But there was also Union campaigns that got all the way into Texas. You might remember we talked about old General Gordon Granger and how he became affiliated with the Juneteenth holiday. So it's safe to say there were military forces that were operating all over. Although, interesting enough, there was also a Confederate military raid that got into Chambersburg, Pennsylvania and burn the city down. Now, remember that a raid is a fast operation. Yep, you're absolutely right, Celeste, and that's probably exactly what happened. 
And so what we see with the Anaconda plan is it's a concept of total war. In other words, it's justifying exactly what happened and why they had all these issues. Well, and, and yeah, isn't it funny that it's a symbol of that as well? And so that's just something to keep in mind with all of it. So suddenly with this Anaconda plan, you have a plan to utterly destroy every aspect of the nation, destroy the cities, cut off all supplies, and control everything. And now we go to the next aspect. Total destruction in the land, loss of life, and even a change in government. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? We have no shortage of photos that show that cities were destroyed. Now, this is South Carolina. Look at the nice brick there. And then you also have these blocks again that we thought were only with star forts, but apparently not. Nice advanced lights, too, in South Carolina in the 1860s. And then, of course, we have these little urns. Remember, we were looking at these with the uh, different sketchbooks that we saw, some of the blocks that this were built out of. And this is Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. So even cities in the north were gutted like this. It's very strange and very interesting. And what you see with this is it's easy to consider the fact that there were many things that were destroyed and there was a large loss of life. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. <laughs> now, there were some other aspects with the Civil War. And here's something I ask you all to do. Look up Iowa in the Civil War, and here's why. Iowa had a number of regiments that fought in the Civil War. And what I'd ask you to do is, if you have the time and the inclination, try to find out what the unit history of those regiments are. Try to see if you can really look into it and really document them. <laughs> well, that's just it. Isn't that funny, Dukes? <laughs> and that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't manufacture enough rifles, but there you go. But you know, they had plenty of supplies and they didn't need to live off the land. And so try documenting, and it's not just Iowa, take any state and try finding the unit history of all the regiments. Things get problematic once you get past their most famous regiments. Now you could say it's just because they didn't keep good records, blah, 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 every excuse that you have, but it's really hard to actually document who was involved with it and what they were really doing. Now, this is uh, Samuel Curtis. We actually visited his home in the Keokuk exploration. He was supposedly affiliated with Iowa. Uh, always interesting hairstyles that we have from the Civil War. The other interesting thing with the Civil War is uh, there's a little bit more to it when we consider uh, what happened with this interesting train chase, the great locomotive chase. And I think this is the origin of, uh, what do we got here? Oh, yeah. From Missouri, Quantrill's Raiders. Yep. And maybe those were real guerrilla fighters, or maybe that was just a legend that was make, made up so they could justify more stringent measures, as they usually tend to be. Now, I think that this great locomotive chase is the origin of America or the United States affiliation with car chases. So they say that a Union force raided Atlanta, stole a locomotive, and then went on a chase to Chattanooga. And unfortunately, they were followed by the Confederates, and eventually they were captured. Now, this is quite an interesting account because they try to say that this train chase happened. So, yeah, the origin of all car chases in the United States. These are the individuals who were involved. We only have five pictures, and then we have a lot of sketches. So, yeah, sketch here, sketch there, sketch here. So, I don't see any problem with this account. Oh, by the way, did you know that this was also made into a Disney movie a while back? Not recently, quite a while back. And then this is supposedly the reunion. So the name of the locomotive they snagged was the general. So I guess not all of them died, but, you know, that's always the change in story. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and uh, Hollywood things is exactly what you tend to have with that as well. Absolutely. Well, maybe. The thing about it is we don't really even know if there's separate sides now, do we? It's really strange how the Civil War started and then how it ended. We're told that it was two sides, but then they just all made well. There was no guerrilla warfare. Quantrill's raiders just hung it up. Now we're told certain people like Jesse James and individuals like that continued fighting. Although you see them on Little House in the Prairie and Jesse James and his brother were heroes, I guess, before they raided Northfield. So <laughs> the fighting was real. The fighting was no doubt real, but what it was about and what the goals of it were, no doubt about it, it was something else completely. 
Ah, great one right there. Yes, the Lincoln-Kennedy synchronization paradox. Now, it makes no sense if what we're told about history is real. It makes perfect sense if everything is just made up now, doesn't it? Absolutely, that's a great point. Now, what exactly is going on with all this? You can take all this evidence. You can look at photos of the Civil War. They may be real. They may not be. Well, that's just what we don't know. We don't know what actual histories were assigned and when. We can assume, and it's an assumption, that what was assigned to the United States was a lot more recent for whatever reason. And I think where the answer to that is found is look into who provides the military muscle for the land. I'll give you a hint. It's not out of Europe. Oh, yeah. And a lot of it probably is. But that's why we have all these interesting accounts that just, that they're supposed to be interesting. We're supposed to talk about them. We're supposed to get emotionally invested in this. We're supposed to feel this. There's a reason why we have Grand Army of the Republic, why they pose for photographs like this. This is James J. Andrews, the guy who supposedly masterminded the great locomotive chase. And we don't even have a picture of him. But oddly enough, when you look at his face, you might uh, recognize those lines. Let me know if you do. Well, it can be. It most definitely can be a paradox. There's no doubt about that. Well, and that's what we don't know. And for those of you who want to see my theories on the matter, uh, check out the Reset War playlist or the Reset War video or the last reset. And you can actually see a lot of the theories that I have on what was going on, because you might be surprised to know that the United States Civil War was not the only conflict going on in the 1860s. There were conflicts all over the land on every major continent. And again, we don't know if the timeline is what we're told that it is. And the Civil War just gives you a lot of problems, a lot of contradictions, and it leaves you with a lot of questions. That's why it's bizarre, and that's why we're here talking about it right now. Exactly. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Oh, yeah. The Barbary Wars. I mean, and it's hard to say exactly what happened and how this all came into being and, you know, what's the real timeline. We just don't know. We really don't know. And so we have some things that may be from our current era. You know, I have the five eras theory. But how do we know we don't have other events? Like, let's just say what we what we think of as medieval times. Maybe that came from the fourth era. Or maybe that came from the reset of the third era to the fourth era. So we just don't know. I mean, there's many different conflicting accounts. There's many different timelines. And we just don't know. So let me go back to one of the telling images. So just bear with me for a second here. I won't go too fast. I don't want to make anybody sick. Here we go. So just a soldier's home. And this goes back to one of the, a lot of the research that I've been doing. Oh, yeah. Same name too, huh? That's where the United States military actually supposedly got its reputation, too. The United States Marines, Stephen Decatur. Oh, yeah. Well, the whole point behind the five, area, or the five era hypothesis is it's just to give some structure to this because we really don't know. But yeah, well, I mean, what do you think of a structure like this? Do you really think they built something like this, right, after 1865 as a place to house veterans? I mean, look how we treat our veterans now. Look how we've always treated our veterans. I hate to say that, but do you really think they're going to this kind of effort because they suddenly cared? <laughs> now, we're told they did. We're told that they put all this effort into taking care of the veterans after the Civil War. But what makes more sense, that they just rapidly built this building or that they had this building and repurposed it? Ah, that's exactly right, OG Scotty Skid Row interviews. You are correct. And that's what we see as a start of the asylum movement. Well, I greatly appreciate that. Now, let's uh, go back to the other one. Now, this is an early exploration from the channel. This is still standing to this day. It's right next to where the Brewers play baseball in Wisconsin, the old Wisconsin Union Soldiers home. 
This was designed by old channel nemesis E. Townsend Mix. Yes, they attribute him to this building as well. You can still go walk this building to this day, and you can see that this is a gigantic compound. And the construction on it's quite, well, I'll just say phenomenal. And it's an early exploration on the channel, so if you want to go watch it, be my guest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Wild alchemical spirit. You're absolutely right. There's all kinds of little resets going on all the time. Yep. You guys are familiar with the name, E. Townsend Mix. He shows up pretty much anywhere in the Midwest United States. If there is an amazing building, he tends to be behind it. And let's not forget his mentor, Sidney Mason Stone. Yeah, they actually try to sell us these names. <laughs> e. Townsend Mix, Sidney Mason Stone. Yeah, who knows on the other names. But also think about that when you think of all these great Civil War generals and what they may have done or what they didn't do. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point right there. Oh, yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, crypto, it's just like that, uh, the paradigm that I have. Conflict, assimilation, indoctrination. That same pattern has never left us. And we still have it to this day. What's one of the other ones? So, again, when you look at this kind of construction here in Fort Warren, I mean, is this anything that we could do today? Could anybody even attempt this? Does anybody bother? Nope. But look, it's okay. You got a plaque. And that 1850, oh gosh, that's horrible. But then you can see in this photo from the Civil War, it looked exactly the same. And so that's why I would encourage you, you know, if you're looking for good explorations wherever you are, at least if you're in the United States, although you can find other conflicts that were going on at the same time in your respective nation, for those of you who aren't from the United States, where you can find these structures associated with them. Now, we'll be told they're used as fortresses, but just imagine if they were actually used as internment compounds, because what we speculate is that the reset conflict was going on. They were targeting all of these enclaves, and these were the locations where they held all the people that they captured. People either agreed to go along with things, they assimilated, or they were killed. Oh, yeah. And I mean, they're all over the place. You know, wherever you are in the land, you'll find examples of this. And some of these still stand to this day, like the Wisconsin Soldiers Home near Milwaukee, right next to where the Brewers play. Oh, by the way, that is still a Veterans Affairs compound that that building's a part of. So it's very, very interesting where it actually applies and what it's all about. But when you think about this and you think about how the, the aspect and the paramount importance of internment camps, concentration camps, prisoner war camps, and how they never went away. That seemed to be a lasting legacy from the conflict. So in a way, you could say it was actually about imposing slavery. And let's talk about how it changed the government. The United States government imposed federal income taxes for the first time during the Civil War. No, it was not 1913 when they first did it. It was actually in the United States Civil War. Furthermore, it also supposedly and officially led to the increased power and centralization of the United States government. It was also the first time they practiced mass military inscription. Oh, yeah. So a lot of interesting things that persist to this day that all came from the Civil War. And then last but not least, it was when they said that they had the first full industrialization of the United States. And then they exercised it again during World War I, according to the official history. Ah, uh, exactly, Robert. Did the states ever actually have rights? I don't know. It's weird. You know, they kind of play it both ways. In 2020, suddenly it seemed like the governors in the states had all kinds of rights. And you had local counties that could suddenly violate the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. Remember in 2020? Oh, yeah. And I'll, you know, just highlight it was also in Wisconsin, too. But, you know, it could have been anywhere. <laughs> Well, and who knows? I mean, maybe it was likely well before that quantum paradox. I mean, it's interesting how the most efficient things that governments do always involve collecting taxes. That's where all the best records are kept. And that's something that you can never try fooling around with. I mean, you can get away with anything else, but oh gosh, if you try to go off on taxes, <laughs> they've got a, a literal army of people that are going to come down on you. And that's not a conspiracy theory. That's a widely known fact. That's exactly what happens. And supposedly this is where it all started. Yeah, I'd like to see that castle myself. 
Ding, ding, ding. Exactly, Celeste. And it's designed to control perceptions and thoughts and to make sure that our minds are not open so we can actually formulate or get an idea of what's really going on. And it's always funny seeing everyone try to defend exactly what we're told happened. I mean, when you see Andersonville here, what's really strange to me is I've been to this part of Georgia extensively. This does not look like any terrain I've ever seen in Georgia at any time of the year. Now, if anybody wants to correct me on that, be my guest. I mean, I'm open to it. But what exactly is going on with this? You know, the prisoner war camps and why are these conditions so squalid? Why are we told that so many died here? Well, and effectively, that's what happened. I mean, even the official history says that, Andrew. That's exactly what happened. Ah, exactly, Rebecca. I mean, can you imagine seeing anywhere in Florida or Georgia that looks like this today? It's just really strange, and it doesn't make any sense to me. And yet they want to tell us that Andersonville was a place where thousands of Union soldiers died. They didn't have the resources to take care of them. They somehow had the resources to keep armies in the field, though, but they didn't have the resources to take care of prisoners in the prisoner war camps. Now, you might be saying, well, that was just the South. They were under a blockade. It makes sense. But there's accounts of the same thing happening in the northern prisoner war camps where they supposedly had all the resources that they needed. It's really, really strange. And it seems to be what they're pushing on to us about what really happened. Yes, these were internment camps, and this is where you get sent. And sorry, but, you know, you're pretty much done once you get sent to one of these places. You either capitulate and comply or you're gone. And if you think about it, it's the same model that we've seen. <laughs> well, and that's just it. And yet, how many people would allow this just because they follow orders and never question anything? Yeah, maybe. Sooner West, maybe. And I'm starting to wonder about that, Sky Sage, especially since we're told that the United States economy is doing so incredibly well, even though it was shut down for a year. I don't know. Maybe they need to shut it down more if it seems to jumpstart it so well, right? <laughs> uh, what else did I want to go over? So Francis Drake, Marion Drake, you might remember Drake University is named after him in Des Moines, Iowa. They still have that nice old main building there that we explored. Odd, odd photo of Lincoln and McClellan. Very strange. And isn't it interesting? What do you see is wrong with this? Does this stand out to anybody? For anybody who knows anything about uh, proper care of the United States flag? <laughs> yeah, I don't think any of us would allow ourselves to go there, Robert. I think that's how we feel. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Now, did they try it or did they just say it? You know, that's the other thing about it. But yeah, they will. They do. Uh, too many stars on the flag, but also the fact that they're using the flag as a freaking tablecloth. You know, because the United States flag is supposed to be a symbol of the United States. You don't use it as a tablecloth, and you sure as heck don't do it when the president's there. Now, maybe we could say, well, the American Legion hadn't come around. They hadn't developed proper flag etiquette, so they were just going to treat it however they wanted to. Oh, thanks, CJ Trickster. I appreciate that. But it's just really weird because you, you just see a flag, and basically it's borderline desecrated, so. <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, you're probably onto something there, Isaac. That probably makes more sense than what we've got from the official history, right? <laughs> yeah. Remember what Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and all the people merely players. Yeah, that was even in the 1980s DuckTales, too. Yeah, it's the same feeling we get, Wendy. Remember that uh, World War II picture we looked at with, uh, oh, no, wait, I didn't show that to everybody. I'll have to show that at some point. Picture with Patton and Eisenhower, and they're all dressed up, and their shoes are shined, and they're just walking through mud. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's see if there's any others we want to review. Oh, wait, Robert E. Lee. I mean, it's funny how they associate him with everything that's South, and yet you have all these images of him standing in front of these very well-constructed buildings. I even like this chair right here. It looks like a very comfortable chair. Nice felt. I mean, you know, what's he standing in front of here? What's exactly going on? 
you look a little closely at these images and they're just, they're really strange. Like even the pictures of the famous generals, none of it really makes a lot of sense and it just creates more questions than you get answers. Looking up the story though behind Arthur MacArthur and the Union charge up Missionary Ridge, that's just bizarre because that's where they try to sell us that, uh, basically it's a non-doctrinal term, a bonsai charge by the Union actually worked. And even though the Confederates held the high ground on Missionary Ridge, they couldn't re repulse the attack. It's really, really strange. I mean, that never happened in the United States Civil War. Oh, yeah. Well, and then there's also what actually applies, too. You know, I mean, do the rights apply, or is it an interpretation of the law? It's really strange. And they always seem to go back and forth to it. Was he? I don't know. You know, and I don't know what to make of uh, the Confederate States of America. I mean... Did they really exist as we're told, or were they just another faction, if you will, of the reset forces? When you look closely at it and you see that the United States military wore blue and gray and a lot of the rest of the world did, it creates a conflicting account. It's hard to say, and I don't think we're supposed to know. Oh, yeah. Chickamauga, Chattanooga, a lot of those battlefields are interesting places just on their own, RB. You are absolutely right. So that's quite an interesting aspect to it as well but then this whole account of braxton bragg the incompetent commanders ambrose burnside being left in command after a failed charge lincoln not accepting his resignation i mean it's just it goes on and on when you have the incompetent leadership why is it we always have this selective leadership incompetence why do we have all these different aspects on the competence spectrum one day, the Confederate Army is very competent. It can defeat much larger Union forces. And then for no reason whatsoever, Robert E. Lee tries a frontal assault, which gets his forces slaughtered. And then it's just a question of time until the war ends. It, I mean, it reads like a bad movie. It really does. Hmm. Well, it's probably a cover for something else. So, oh, yeah, that's a good point there, Sky Sage. You're right. Yep. Robert E. Lee's property was seized and it is now Arlington Cemetery. His house is still there and it's intact. I featured it in an early exploration. So, oh yeah. Oh, it is, Celeste. It is actually what was his home. And uh, we're told that uh, the home on it was built in the early 1800s. I remember featuring it in early exploration. So, yeah, I know. Maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but. I got to say, though, uh, in Gettysburg, I did appreciate Richard Jordan's portrayal of uh, General Armistead. But, you know, I'm always a fan of Richard Jordan. He passed away way too young. I think he was one of the legitimate actors. You might remember him from Logan's Run. When we reviewed that movie, he played uh, Francis Seven quite well, in fact, even though he was the bad guy. Oh, yeah. Corinth is very interesting, Chassis. Yeah, it's something else I'm going to have to look into in a little bit more detail. What do you think of this photo? I just had to come back to this one. This uh, Union cannon crew from the Battle of Gettysburg. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Let me guess, Sooner. Uh, you're over six feet tall. <laughs> if I remember those qualifications. <laughs> or did they waive that when you were in? I remember there there was a certain height requirement if you're going to be in the old guard, the third infantry regiment. <laughs> well, they say that he did, but it's a little bit more of a legend. There's a lot of things that became legend that weren't necessarily fact. So, yeah, I'd say it does, in a manner of speaking. Yeah, I agree with that, Sky Sage. <laughs> And that's the question you should ask whenever you see any Civil War photo. What's the authenticity behind it? Because a lot of them, at best, are very questionable. You know, whichever battle you're looking at. Oh, uh, yeah, here's one of my favorite ones. The massive technology of the Intrepid. Isn't this a great balloon? I think I can... Can I see through the balloon here? <laughs> did, did they forget the top part of the balloon and they had to sketch it in? Or are we just supposed to believe it's an eroded photograph? It's a deteriorated photograph. You know, we only had the best photography until we didn't. 
Oh yeah, that's a good question there, Celeste. We just don't know. Yeah, super advanced tech, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> Fort Riley's a strange place too, Waffle Gear. Yeah, the 1st Infantry Division. They're starting to, RB. You got to keep going though. Yeah, maybe, Kit, maybe. Yeah, it's probably painted Photoshop without a doubt behind it. I still find these hydrogen machines so very, very interesting. And what do you think of the USS Alligator? Do you think this really existed? Was this the uh, motivation for uh, Jules Verne's Captain Nemo? The Nautilus was actually the Alligator. <laughs> hey, Adam Baum, good to see you. Oh, yeah. Ancient satellite technology. That's right. No doubt about it, Katie. No doubt about it. Oh, yeah. I definitely have. I'll have to follow that up with an exploration. So, But anyway, in summary, a lot of indications that the Civil War is not what we're told it was, that there was something else going on, that it was a technological industrial revolution, but then we had another technological industrial revolution after it. We had cities that suddenly grew up really quickly, such as Atlanta, even though Atlanta wasn't around that long prior to the Civil War, but it was a major city because it was a rail hub, blah, 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 blah. And so it's just a lot of conflicting accounts and it's really, really strange. So, but in any event, uh, give me one minute. Let me leave you on a good image. I'll be right back and I'll take any questions that you have and sky's the limit on that. I know I'm flipping fast. Just bear with me. There we go. Here's a good one. So I will be right back.
Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. So what do you think? These interesting structures. <laughs> hey, thanks for that, Sooner West. I really appreciate it. And it's a blast talking about the Civil War. And so maybe the one question I'll look to field is, would you like to see more explorations like this? Can you hear me? Oh, don't tell me they messed up again. Hey, can anybody hear me? Okay, just making sure. Strange things happening. Okay, so more explorations into this questionable historical time frame. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that the live stream went as well as it did. Usually I have all kinds of uh, unique uh, technical difficulties that we'll leave at that. So, all right. Well, it seems like it's a popular topic, and we certainly don't have to be limited to the United States Civil War. There's a lot of other questionable history that uh, we can look into. So, But by all means, you can hit me up on any kind of message and let me know. All right. Well, it looks like I'm getting quite a lot of consensus that we should keep looking into these. So I was going to look to shift to cryptids, but um, do you want to go to cryptids or would you like to stay with this uh, strange history? <laughs> it's a good question there, Earl. I wish I knew the answer to it. Okay. Follow up. So another one on the Civil War, maybe. Or would you like to go look at uh, some of those questionable years? I mean, even 1947 is a very questionable year. So. <laughs> well, there's all kinds of things that we can look into. Late 1800s, Cynthia, or are you talking about uh, the Tunguska event? All right. Well, it sounds like we've got no shortage of what we should talk about next. You know, because I, I prefer to switch things up a little bit, talk about one topic and then go to a different topic. Oh, yeah. So maybe next week we'll see how cryptids goes and then we'll go back to examining history again. So yeah, Tunguska, more uncivil war. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question there, Tony. That's a really good question. That's something I need to dig into a little bit more. Oh uh, yes. I see what you're a fan of there, crypto. I guess I'm not too surprised. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Maybe uh, talking about the time paradox. That's a good one, Joseph. I'll have to keep that in mind. Oh yeah, Adam. Yeah. It's hard to know, you know, what happened around 1850 to 1830, what's real and what's not. So. Ah, okay. Well, heck, we see uh, examples of that every day. Just look who read the news and what they say and what they think. Ah, I only talked about them in one video, Rebecca. Yeah, that's probably a good thing to start to, to start to explore into next week. You're right. Oh, yeah, we got all kinds of things that we can look at. Extraterrestrials or ultra terrestrials. Oh, yeah, T-Fetch. Yeah, I don't know if you were here when uh, we did that live stream. We we tried to breach that one. My goodness, did I get a lot of pushback on that. <laughs> it's a PSYOP. It's a PSYOP. Yeah, whenever someone screams something's a PSYOP. Yeah, I did that too, Leonard, in December. Same thing. Can't imagine why. I guess there's just some people out there that don't appreciate the topic, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Alchemy. Now, I got that one on the uh, on-deck circle there, Adam. That's a good one, too. All right, so uh, I will post all of these great structural photos that we looked at and then a couple of the other questionable ones up on the old channel Reddit. So, Hey, Rebecca, have you ever heard the song Not Your Kind of People by Garbage? It's a great song. I think it applies to a lot of us. We're not extraterrestrials. We're just not their kind of people. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, Maxwell. That's kind of the go-to. It's a psyop, so don't talk about it. It's all good, Leonard. I mean, we can always go back to it and give it another whirl. 
If uh, you look on the, the channel's alternate locations, I think you can still find that uh, live stream on the uh, shape of the land, as we said. Oh, yeah. Gulliver, Gulliver, Gulliver's Travels is a good one, Jamie. Dog face pony soldier. Funny how they still talk about that a lot, too, Heidi. You hear that a lot. Okay, so we got historical examinations. We got cryptids. We got alchemy. A lot of good topics up, so. Yeah. Well, you remember, Chassis, I'm not so concerned about numbers. I'm just more concerned about quality, conversation, and great ideas. And I've got to say, you've got some wonderful ideas, all of you. So I think we'll have to get into it, Tara. We'll have to talk about that. There's quite a, there's a story, there's a legend, there's an official account behind it. So a lot of interesting things. Well, thanks, Kathy. I appreciate that. Yeah, that's exactly right, Noah. And maybe that's why they don't want us to think in different ways. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Crazy things can happen. Hey, Rabbit, good to see you. Yeah, probably. Going back in one of the earlier eras there, so. Well, I think we'll give cryptids a try. I've been wanting to uh, breach that topic for a while. Coming very soon, Quantum Paradox, coming soon. But remember, that's another quote-unquote sensitive topic, so i got to be careful about how I approach it. Yeah, exactly, Sky Sage. They look exactly alike, don't they? Definitely gives you that impression, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, Crypto, while well, I'm here, so be my guest. Probably half and half, Jamie. I'd say it's half and half. There's always some truth to everything, so that way they can back it up with a little truth. Hmm, good question on that one. Well, I didn't see the wolf man when I was exploring uh, St. Coletta, but they say there's one around there, that uh, little school I looked at in Wisconsin, the channel's first exploration, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Sky Sage. I'm supposed to stay in my box. I have a problem doing that. I don't know if you've noticed. I've got a real serious problem doing that, so. Okay, so we want another poll. All right, I will fire up another poll tomorrow morning, and... On the channel public page, I'll also publish uh, the link for posting these images on the Reddit. So, oh, we got more requests for Zeppelins. Hey, I can always talk about airships. Those are always interesting. So, terraforming and, uh, oh, whoa, we could definitely do that too, Celeste. So, that's probably actually looking into the earlier eras. I actually suspect that the Dark Ages were the reset period between the third and the fourth era. And then they just rolled it over to our current era to confuse us. So it is real. It happened. But when it happened is up for debate. But who knows for sure. So. All right. Well, I really appreciate everybody being here. And this was a great exploration. And I'm glad this was received so well because I really enjoy these things. And so we will definitely continue. So put up the poll tomorrow. Don't mind my peas. And we will continue on. But as always, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for watching the channel. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but yesterday was the one year anniversary of the channel. And it's just been a blast of a journey. And thank you for that, Rebecca. I really appreciate that. And I just want to say all of you are amazing with the great ideas that you bring and the fact that we can all collaborate here. And pretty much everybody I've always seen on these chats. And no, you don't have to agree with me. I like it when you don't. Because I think we really get somewhere. We look at different ideas when we can. And in fact, my evolution, my modification of the five errors theory has come from all the input that you provided in all these live streams. So I greatly appreciate it. All right. Well, y'all have a great evening. Yes, I said y'all very intentionally. Hey, Julia, good to see you. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you on the next exploration. So I will put out a poll tomorrow and I will post the images to Reddit. You all have a great weekend wherever you are in the land. I'll give you the, uh, the classic explanation here, Benza. Russell Nash from Highlander. I'm from lots of different places and I really am. Y'all have a good night. Take care of yourselves.